Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melanie Dawn Molina Wood. I am your educational program coordinator here with Anywhere Integrated Services, and we're going to present a Real 1031 today, uh, Finding Hidden Listings and Motivating Clients with Like Kind Exchanges. We will get started right at the top of the hour. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, appreciate everything you've been doing uh, to get this going for us. And also Owen and uh, my counterpart here today, David, is with us. <clears throat> so we're going to be going over finding hidden listing, hitting hidden listings and motivating clients with like kind exchanges. Um, next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, meet your instructor. So let's go ahead and say a little bit about us. I'll start with David. Uh, David is an Esquire and also a certified exchange special specialist. He's a senior uh, 1031 exchange advisor here with us at Real 1031. He is a member of the uh, Federation of Exchange Accommodators. He is a past president and also, David, now you serve on the ethics committee. And he has over 30 years of experience in 1031 exchanges. Uh, my name is Brad Duggar. I'm a senior 1031 exchange advisor and uh, don't have quite as an extensive resume like David does, but I do have um, over 15 years of real estate experience myself. All right, next slide, please. So a little bit about Real 1031. Uh, we've gone through a couple of different uh, names, but still been the same crew. Uh, we've been uh, Realogy 1031 services and for nearly 20 years, uh, Real 1031 has served as a qualified intermediary in the exchange process. We've helped investors defer capital gains tax on the sale of their business or investment property. And <clears throat> why us versus um, any other QI? Uh, well, we have a dedicated staff and many years of experience. Uh, we execute uh, exchanges nationwide. And uh, the most important thing here is not just the expertise, but uh, treating your clients like they're ours. OK, so what does uh, Section 1031 say? It says no gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of real property that's held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. If such real property is exchanged solely for real property of like kind, which again is to be held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. Uh, we wanna pay particular attention to some key words here. Uh, real property held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment and the term like kind. So obviously this has to be an asset that is performing uh, and then um, real property, obviously it's going to be that uh, real estate itself. Um, no personal property is included in that at all. Keep in mind that this is a uh, tax deferral. This is not a uh, tax abatement or a tax-free transaction. Uh, it is strictly a de deferral, not an elimination. Okay, so let's go over some basic things here. We'll go over an exchange versus a purchase and a sale. Well, in exchange, we are deferring the capital gains taxes that would be associated with if you were to uh, do a sale for an investment property, obviously those taxes would be owed. Um, I like to say you kind of uh, put it in a Folgers can, put the lid on and kind of kick it down the road with each exchange that you do. It does have to be um, business or investment property. Um, it can't be uh, like a primary residence um, or second home, uh, which David may touch on that a little bit later. Uh, there are some time restrictions here. Uh, closing on the property that you're selling, the relinquished property. Um, that starts the entire exchange. That is day zero, right? And then the first, that's 180 days, and then the first 45 days of that is the identification period. Now, when you exchange, uh, you know, a property that you're selling for a property that you're purchasing, you you want to exchange equal or up in value, right? Uh, if you go down in value or don't exchange everything, including the debt that's on the property, which is very important, um, then it's considered a partial uh, exchange and not a full deferral. Um, constructive receipt, that just means that 
the <clears throat> with the proceeds cannot touch the hands of the taxpayer. Uh, so we hold the funds for the transaction from the relinquished property until the replacement property or properties is identified when they go to close. We wire the funds down for that. That is how the entire deferral is able to happen. Like kind. Well, it's not, uh, I like to say, anywhere the tax man can go because it, it's not where he doesn't go. Um, it has to be a property that is held um, in, the, in the United States. So no foreign property at all, um, but you can do um, all different kinds of property. Um, you can do commercial property, residential. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, it's a common misconception. People want to say condo for condo or single family residence for a single family residence. Um, it's not necessarily like that. You can sell a commercial building and buy uh, residential property. Um, vacant land will always qualify for an exchange. Uh, but again, it has to be uh, held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. Okay, so how 1031 exchanges benefit investors? Well, you preserve the equity that you have in a property. So if you take the equity and replace that equity over here without having to um, come out of pocket for those uh, capital gains taxes, you're preserving that equity moving it forward. Um, you're able to leverage the investment properties that you do have. Um, I have conversations often with exchangers about um, diversifying their uh, their portfolio when it comes to real estate. Or maybe they want to uh, kind of uh, consolidate down from having so many properties uh, to now they just want a few or maybe they just want to go into a commercial building and just have to manage that. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they may see a market that is performing better than the market that they are in and that market may be in uh, another city in another state. Um, so they can relocate that asset uh, to a better performing area. Management relief. This has to deal with um, with people who are um, kind of tired of uh, uh, sick and tired of having to deal with uh, the management of properties all the time. Uh, they may want to kind of get out of that and go into more passive forms uh, of uh, exchange into other passive forms of uh, real estate. And then this is a very important to us. We say it's the best kept secret in investment real estate, uh, but it is uh, used a lot for uh, estate planning purposes. Uh, so we encourage the use of, uh, of uh, a CPA or an accountant, um, a financial advisor, uh, an attorney uh, for estate planning, uh, anything of that nature. Uh, we definitely encourage uh, the use of that. <clears throat> and how does it benefit uh, real estate professionals? Well, there is a potential for two commissions from one sale. Uh, it could be the relinquished and the replacement. Uh, another thing is if uh, your client uh, customer is uh, purchasing property that is out of your uh, normal area of expertise, that is an opportunity for a referral. So you will be able to gain referrals on that. Um, we often see exchangers, they, they can uh, sell one property and they'll end up purchasing three. So that could be a total of four different commissions for you. And then the seller of the replacement property, you would still be able to uh, have that client and work on that transaction. Again, send out a referral for, uh, for the uh, replacements. And then uh, what about uh, jumping up in value? We just said uh, equal or up in value. Uh, those are going to be even larger commissions. And uh, the great thing about working with an exchanger uh, is that they are on a time frame and they are essentially um, a cash buyer. Um, most of the time they are a cash buyer. Um, bigger commissions, I'd, I'd say uh, bigger properties, uh, gives you a chance to uh, kind of expand your uh, real estate expertise as well. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to the man of the hour, Mr. Gorenberg, to Actually, take us into this next section. Before we get into the next section, Brad, do you mind taking a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, I can take Yes, them. you can. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, 
how long after a sale do you have to find the, the replacement property, the new investment property? So you have 45 days to identify. Um, and it's really important that um, <clears throat> you identify within those 45 days because after that 45th day, no other properties can be introduced to the exchange. Um, when that happens, uh, it does uh, uh, disallow you to move forward with anything else. So it's it's very important that you identify, and that's part of our job is we we keep you uh, up to date and in line uh, with your exchange so that we can make sure that you get a full deferral from this. Um, but yeah, 45 days and it starts on day zero, which is the closing of the relinquished property. Okay, so 45 days to identify and then how long to actually close on the replacement property? After the 45th day, you will have 135 days left in your exchange. And that yeah. is to go ahead and close. Um, it just important reminder, just don't, uh, you're not going to be able to identify anything after that 45 days. Perfect. And then um, can you, uh, we know that you cannot do residential uh, property or homesteaded property, I should say, but can you purchase a residential lot and still have it be like kind? Absolutely. Uh, vacant land will always qualify for exchange treatment, um, but the the key point here is what is the uh, taxpayer's intent whenever they purchase the replacement property? Um, intent seems to be the most significant factor uh, when the IRS is trying to do an audit or trying to figure out um, uh, if they're going to allow the exchange or disallow the exchange. Um, intent is that number one figure. If your intent is to buy a vacant lot to build a property on it, um, whether that's single family, maybe you want to do uh, multifamily, maybe a fourplex, duplex, whatever the case may be, uh, that's your intent whenever you did purchase it. Okay, so, or yeah. or just sit on it and wait for it to appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, there was a, a tiny bit of confusion um, because you had said, you know, held for productive use. Mm -hmm. So you're not eliminating the ability to buy vacant land with that wording, correct? No, not at all. No, it doesn't okay. uh, doesn't discount that at all. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and, and um, move over to, to David. And then David, when you have a minute, we've got a couple more questions that we can let you address. Sounds good. And I, I, I want to further clarify that last point. Vacant land is fine. Brad had mentioned that early in like the first or second slide that that the property should be performing. It doesn't have to be performing. It simply needs to have been acquired for investment intent. And, and Brad did very clearly say that. So I just want to make sure that um, uh, people aren't confused by that point. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. OK, so how do we use 1031 exchanges to motivate taxpayers and define hidden listings. And I define hidden listings as those that are not active. Nobody has gone to visit a real estate agent and said, hey, I think I should sell this. This is a property that the, the owner is sitting on it. And the reason they're sitting on it is because they know nothing about 1031 exchange and they are fearful that if they sell the property today, they will have to pay taxes. And we're going to educate them and help them not have to pay the taxes and help them be able to sell that property. So I start with the idea that we're going to be thinking outside the box. It's my experience that most real estate agents start in the business. Uh, they join a local real estate office. They are assigned a mentor. They learn at somebody else's feet as they're growing their business. And each new real estate agent, more or less, is learning to do what the prior real estate agent do, did who learned to do what their mentor had done, who learned to do what their mentor had done. So uh, absent introducing new technology, people are still doing largely the same thing that they've been doing for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And I'm suggesting that we don't have to do that. I know in my mailbox on a regular basis, I get um, postcards that say, I can help you sell your home. That's wonderful, I'm not interested. I get uh, mailings with uh, the recipe of the month. That's wonderful. I'm not interested. Uh, I get mailings with the local college football 
schedules. That's wonderful. I'm not interested. Um, so I wonder personally how effective those marketing strategies are. And I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that when those mailings come to me, that money could have been better spent elsewhere. So. Um, David, I, you are I, on mute again. Okay, yep, there you here are. we go. I, I went to push the button to change the slide and I pushed the mute button. Um, Been there that. <laughs> yeah, you'd think after two and a half years of this stuff, we'd be more adept at it. Um, <laughs> geez, we're coming up on three years now. Um, so, you know, the typical listing is the homeowner wants to relocate, they're upsizing, they're downsizing, they, they're buying a second home, they're selling their second home, whatever it is. <clears throat> the atypical listings are those that don't just show up uh, through the normal course of business. And that's where I'm talking about here. These are uh, investors or other property owners who are sitting on their property because they're fearful of the tax man. So how do we find these atypical listings? These I did it again. OK, I'm going to keep the mouse over here. <laughs> <laughs> you can teach an old dog new tricks, except not me. Um, OK, so the first step we're going to do, and I'm going to apologize in advance if my dog barks. Mommy's out running errands and she's staring out the window waiting for mommy to come home. So I'm going to apologize in advance if she barks. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is forget the box. We don't need to do things the same way everybody else has done it. We don't need to do things the same way everybody else in our office is doing. Um, it's also my experience. Every office has one superstar performer and he or she is doing something and that's great, but that doesn't necessarily mean we need to do that. We can define our businesses differently. So I think outside the box, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. And the first thing we're going to do is learn to position ourselves. And what do I mean by that? Well, you're going to start to focus your energies on understanding investment properties, understanding what motivates investors. Um, some investors are in it entirely for cash flow. They want a property that's going to spin off a thousand or two thousand or three thousand dollars a month, whatever it may be. And they want that cash to supplement their their personal cash flow at home. So maybe they don't have to work as hard or maybe they don't have to have a, a, a traditional nine to five type job at all. Um, so though that's one group of people. Another group of people might be buying property, not so much for the cash flow, the present cash flow today, but for the long term appreciation. Um, maybe the cash flow is nice, but they're really more interested in, in buying a property that they believe will grow over time theoretically and hopefully faster than the month than the value would grow if they had simply put that money in the bank on the day they bought that property. Um, so you're going to want to, in my humble opinion, you're going to want to consider taking some additional classes to understand what motivates uh, investors, how investors analyze properties, what communities are good for investors and some that may not be so good for investors. Uh, for example, I, I'm aware of one particular transaction where it's a publicly known transaction. We rely on on the facts of this case quite often. The taxpayer had bought a piece of property to use as an investment. He bought it as part of a 1031 exchange and after having owned it for six months, he had virtually no interest from prospective tenants. Um, the reason he had gotten poor advice and bought a wonderful property, but the people who could afford to rent that property didn't want to rent, they only wanted to buy. So uh, the point is you're gonna want to be able to understand and evaluate and assess how investors make their decisions. Okay. Next thing we have to do is actually find these investors. 
Um, the last time I checked, first of all, we don't even have a phone book anymore, so it's not even like you could turn to the page in the phone book that says real estate investors. However, there are real estate investor clubs. Uh, the largest group of real estate investor clubs around the country is uh, under an umbrella organization called National Real Estate Investors Association. There are chapters of the National Real Estate Investors Association all around the country, I think in about 40 or 42 different states. It could be a little bit more. Some of these groups are very, very active and very, very large. Uh, I was speaking this morning with the, uh, I'm sorry, yesterday afternoon with the head of one of the uh, groups here in New Jersey, and he has over 850 active members in his group. And his group has meetings all over the southern New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, northern Delaware market. So there are 850 captive people. Active may not be the right word, but certainly attentive people. Um, and that's just in my little neck of the woods. So if you're in Miami or Detroit or Boston or, or wherever you may be, there may be clubs like this. This morning, I stumbled upon something that I thought was very interesting. I was on Meetup going to schedule my time for um, uh, pickleball this weekend, and I noticed that there are two real estate, two completely unaffiliated real estate groups uh, right in my own backyard. So I joined those on Meetup just to see what's going on. There are also internet internet based groups like Bigger Pockets where you may want to join and become involved. But with the real estate investor clubs, they tend to have a monthly meeting. Uh, many of them allow you to show up at the first one for free as a guest, as a visitor. Um, you can see what's going on. You can check out the competition. You can figure out how to position yourself and you can do some networking with not only investors, but other service providers who may help you work with the investors. So I would encourage you to consider looking into that. OK, so where do we go once we found them? Well, we're going to go fishing. And this is the time where you want to focus on fishing in a small pond rather than in a giant ocean. If you know that there are 850 fish in a small pond versus 850 fish in a large lake or a large ocean, where do you think your results are going to be stronger? My hunch is that they'll be bigger, they'll be better in the area where we know we're going to find them. So we're going to go and target our marketing and our efforts to fishing in that area where we know the investors hang out. Now, how do we invest? We have to approach these investors. Part of it is going to, again, become active in some of these groups maybe start preparing some newsletters. I don't know what kind of newsletters you may send out in your mailings or you may have on your website. Certainly there is information available on the Real 1031 Exchange website that uh, you can download and, and sort of tailor for your own purposes. That would be a good first start. You can go a little further and you can start offering some education to these folks. On a regular basis, I'm out and about giving seminars either for a local real estate office or a larger real estate board. I know Brad is doing the same. Um, and I, I did a, I had a, uh, a group of seminars a few years back with a uh, particularly productive real estate agent who held meetings at the local. Um, Yacht Club, I use that term in quotes. The yachts weren't huge super yachts. They were just sailboats, um, nothing huge. Uh, but the point is that she held these meetings on Sundays at the at the Yacht Club and invited other members of the Yacht Club to come to these meetings. I thought the targeting there was incredibly shrewd because almost by definition, the members at this this boating club, this yacht club, um, were reasonably wealthy and had expendable income, and might they have uh, investment real estate? So 
when she set up these programs, she had invited me. She invited her friendly title agent and she invited a friendly lender. And the four of us spoke over the course of 90 minutes while these investors were all in the room enjoying a continental breakfast that the four of us chipped in to pay for. Um, so on any given Sunday, we had 40 or 50 people showing up to listen to us talk and educate them about the value of a 1031 exchange. What does title insurance do for you? Um, how to go shopping for a mortgage, what the real estate market looks like today, interest rates, all of that information. So providing this edu education to the investors or the potential investors uh, got her and me candidly in front of this group of people on a regular basis. On top of that, you're going to want to consider sending out some kind of regular updates. If you're not already sending out some kind of a newsletter, this would be a good time to get started. Once you have identified who those investors are and you continue to, to tag those in your database so that you send your investors targeted mailings about uh, what's going on in the investment market. What does NAR say is going to happen with interest rates in the next six months? What are the economists are saying about which real estate markets are hot, which ones are, are cooling off, uh, those kinds of things. And the content isn't difficult to come up with. There are plenty of resources out there and the content doesn't need to be voluminous. Uh, I suspect just a couple hundred words that you fit into an email screen or onto the back of a postcard, depending on what mode suits your personality best. Now, here's the best part. You've now helped these investors by showing them ways that they can reposition their investment properties. One of the key reasons that people do a 1031 exchange. So first of all, the primary reason that I've noticed that people don't is because they're not aware of it. But one of the key reasons that they will do a 1031 exchange is they own a piece of property over here on the east side of the county and you know, the, the, the demographics there just aren't supporting the property anymore. They'd really like to relocate to the west side of the county. Maybe they'd like to go upstate. Maybe they'd like to go to a different state. Uh, they can do all of that. Maybe the property taxes where they are. I'm in New Jersey, the fourth highest property taxes in the country. Um, um, maybe the taxes where they're invested aren't favorable. Maybe they can go someplace where the, the total tax burden is a little uh, more favorable. They can invest in a property that may generate a higher income, that may generate the same income but have less maintenance involved. They, as Brad mentioned earlier, it's, it's part of their estate planning. They're going to continue to invest and invest and invest, and when they pass, here's where it gets really valuable. OK, make note of this. When the taxpayer sells the property outright, they have to pay capital gains tax. But if they die, they will never have had to pay capital gains tax and their heirs won't have to pay capital gains tax either. Their heirs will inherit the property at the fair market value as of the date of their death. It's called a step up in basis. And the best part about all of this is that their CPA never told them about this. How do I know? Because I can't tell you how many times in a month we hear from taxpayers and attorneys and others that their CPA knows less about 1031 exchange than they do. So you're now sharing this information with an investor or a prospective um, customer when the CPA never shared that information with them. You have just now built a nice referral source. You've built a loyal referral source, someone who sees value in you and from whom you can derive value. Because as Brad pointed out, if they sell the property outright, you got one commission or one side of one commission. But if they're doing a 1031 exchange, 
at the very least, you're getting two sides. They're going to sell the first property. They're going to buy the second property. And the worst case scenario is they want to buy in a state, seven states away from you where you can't help them. So you go into your referral network and you refer them to somebody in that community and you get a referral fee out of it. There's nothing wrong with that. So this can help you generate not only more referrals, but quality referrals. And these people will be loyal to you for as long as, as they possibly can be. And you and they will both derive great, great value from that education that you've provided them. So that's where we are at the end of the formal presentation. Melanie and, and Owen, I'm sure there are more questions. Yes, thank you very much, David, and thank you, Brad. Um, we will go ahead and start the Q&A section of the presentation here today. And so if you guys have any questions that are attending the webinar here today, please feel free to go ahead and put them in that Q&A section and we'll make sure to get to as many of them as we can. Um, you know, the very first question that I wanted to go ahead and hit on is I have had a couple of them to ask if this is being recorded and if they can access this recording later. Um, the answer to that is indeed yes, this is being recorded. Uh, Melanie has posted at the very beginning of the Q&A section um, the link to our virtual training under Anywhere um, Integrated Services. And then on the bottom of that page, we do see um, what we call our Real Source Expertise On Demand. It's a YouTube page where we actually have all of the recordings for not only this class that will be posted um, after it's completed and, and edited, but then also some of the other prior classes that we've done through Real Source University. Um, the, the next question that we really have, this one will go actually to Brad. And Brad, the question is in regards to a partial exchange. Can you can you elaborate on what a partial exchange is? What, what you mean by that term? Yeah, so it wouldn't qualify for full tax deferral because if they're buying down, um, then then they're not actually trading equal or up, right? Uh, same thing would happen if um, if they didn't replace the debt or um, uh, supplement that with cash to buy down. And David, you probably have the the legal explanation of this, <laughs> so please chime in. Sure. There because partials are just a little bit different, but it's, it means exactly that it's partial. Yeah, thank you, Brad. And, and Brad's right. The shorthand answer is that if you trade equal or up, it's a complete exchange. If you trade down, it's a partial exchange. Let me give a simple example. If a taxpayer sold property for $400,000 and they only bought a replacement property for $300,000, that $100,000 difference is now exposed to tax. They don't get, for example, a simple 75% 1031 exchange and 25% not 1031 exchange. It actually is all going to vary based on what was their original, what was their adjusted basis in the property they sold, how much gain was there. If they purchased that first property for 300, well, actually, here's the math that, that I frequently see. Somebody will buy a property for $200,000 and sell it for 400. And now they only want to reinvest the gain of that incremental $200,000. In that situation, they have sheltered nothing because they bought the first property for two. They bought the second property for two. The $200,000 in gain didn't get reinvested. But if they bought that first property for two, sold it for four and then reinvested for three, they've sheltered half of the game. Yeah, great answer. Thank you, David. Uh, the next question I'll give it to you as well. Um, can you expand on the identification process? The specific question is in order to identify, do you have to actually be under contract for that property? Um, what does that process look like in greater detail? I love that question. Thank you for asking. The the regulations say that the taxpayer must submit a written document that they sign. Uh, and that the properties must be identified with specificity. Typically, that means give me the street address, uh, give me the apartment number, 
um, a tax parcel ID number, that kind of a thing. The property does not need to be under contract. And in fact, the regulations allow for the taxpayer to provide multiple slash alternative identifications. So the identification form, and by the way, there's not a specific IRS form to do this. We have a form that we've created that we think is useful, but it could just as easily be on the back of your business card or a, or a cocktail napkin. Um, but the, the, identity, the regulations provide for the taxpayer to be able to say, I intend to acquire one of the following three properties. And we encourage folks to come up with more than one property because the odds of um, somebody getting from day zero to day 180 with none of those three properties falling through for any reason are pretty small. If we were all in the same room right now where I could see you all, I would ask you who here has been in business for more than a year and a fair number of you would raise your hands. And then I would say, okay, you folks keep your hands up how many of you have never had a transaction fail and all of your hands would go down? Um, transactions do fall through. So uh, you submit this written form, typically with up to three properties. You can buy all of them. You can simply say, I'm buying one of these three. And then you must buy from that list. Thank you, David. And this last one I'll also give to you as well on this um, same train of thoughts. Um, what happens if you can't find a property to identify within the first 45 days? And as an exchange accommodator, is it our job or is it one of our um, services that we offer to help someone actually find replacement property? Well, we're not real estate licensees, so we're not actually going to go out and help them kick tires and, and open doors directly. Um, though there are many times I wish we could. That said, we, we certainly have a large network of real estate professionals around the country that we can hopefully refer them to. Um, when somebody gets to day 45, actually one of the things that I know Brad and I are very proactive about, if the taxpayer's getting close to day 45 and they're having a hard time identifying something, we start to educate them on alternative ideas. And, and this would lead into a whole separate seminar on a whole different day, but the taxpayer can acquire what is known as a Delaware statutory trust, essentially buying a small, very small fractional interest of a very large, typically commercial building, sometimes an apartment complex or a shopping mall that's professionally managed. And the taxpayer simply collects their share of the rent each month without having to do any work. It's also something good for someone to consider if they're uh, nearing retirement age and they don't want to be an active landlord anymore. But the point of this question was once they start to get to around day 30 or 35, uh, if we haven't received an identification, we may reach out and say, hey, can we help? We'll make an introduction to an appropriate broker who can help them find these Delaware statutory trusts. And they're also good as a backup in case properties one and two fall through. Terrific. Thank you, David. The next question will be directed to Brad. Brad, um, the question is, where is 10, Real 1031 based and where, what is the fee to do a 1031 exchange? We've already heard where, where David is based personally. Um, I don't think you shared, Brad, where you're located and then where kind of is the company located and then what's the fee? Um, <clears throat> we are located everywhere, but I just happen to be in Tampa. No, we're actually located anywhere. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I'm down in uh, Tampa, Florida, um, uh, down in the sunshine. Um, but the second part of that question was, Owen, refresh me. Oh, a typical yeah. fee. Typical fee for a 1031 exchange. Uh, for a forward exchange, um, anywhere between uh, usually on average about uh, 11 to 1200 um, up to uh, right around the 2000 mark. Um, just all depends on variables and you know how many properties that they are purchasing. Uh, that's that detailed conversation that we get into. 
because um, we don't we don't overcharge or anything like that. We just uh, we just want to make sure that uh, they're making sound decisions, and then we're able to help them out with uh, you know doing that personalized quote for them. Thanks, Brad. Good explanation. Uh, do you mind going in second into what maybe a consultation process may look like, or what you would recommend if someone was just uh, trying to experiment with the idea of doing a 1031? Yeah, absolutely. Um, pick up the phone and, and give us a call. Um, pretty simple as that. We uh, I can also schedule appointments, David, as well. If um, you know we need a uh, an SME involved. Um, if I ever get stumped on something, uh, David is my first go to. Um, and we'll usually team up together on a phone call and really vet out the exchange. Um, and sometimes we even involve the uh, the CPA or uh, the taxpayer's attorney uh, if they would like that as well, just so they feel. Because um, our our thing is is a uh, is an informed exchanger is a happy exchanger. Um, they're making their own decisions. They're with the tools that we provide them with. So we like that. Like to make sure that that happens. Thanks, Brad. And I'll throw one more your way. Um, can the 1031 exchange be done if a seller is deciding to do one at the closing table? Um, how or or if not, how far ahead of closing should a 1031 exchange really be set up? I'd say give me a call um, prior to listing, right? Uh, so that we can make sure whenever you're going through and you're, you're listing the property or whatnot, uh, we want to make sure that we're we're vetting everything out for the client. They have a clear direction uh, or a clear decision on the direction that they would like to go. Um, I would say do that or as you have the property listed, uh, go through that process with us. Um, just make sure it's going to qualify and we can really have that extensive conversation with what do you want to do going forward. Now, um, there's a second part to that that I wanted to elaborate on. Um, and they call us from the closing table. Yes, I do have a funny story on that one. <laughs> uh, an exchanger called me and said, I think I might want to do an exchange and I'm like, perfect. You know, let's take down some information, this and that. And uh, he, uh, I was like, when do you close? And he said, well, I'm actually, I'm actually driving to, uh, to the closing office right now. And uh, she's aware though. Uh, I let her know that I was going to be doing an exchange and I was like, Oh boy, so definitely got it together real quick. Um, that was my one of my claim to fames with that. I got that exchange uh, ready to go, signed, sealed, and delivered to title uh, to have them uh, you know, do the process on their end and then make sure that everything was perfect on the closing disclosure. And uh, 45 minutes, I want to say, 35, 45 minutes. Um, I'm not a fan of doing those <laughs> but, because it is kind of stressful, but um, he did supply me with all the right information and we were able to get that taken care of. Perfect. Thank you, Brad. David, I'm going to go ahead and switch uh, the questioning back to you. The question is, is there a limit on how many 1031 exchanges you can roll into a uh, specific investment? For example, can you sell a rental house, buy a piece of bare land, sell the land and then buy a, um, let's say four single family rentals? Well, that's a good one. There is no limit on the number of 1031 exchanges you can do in a year, uh, in your lifetime, how many times you can roll a property over. You do want to be careful, however, that each property you acquire is held as an investment property. If you sell the single family rental and then buy a piece of raw land and then six weeks later you sell the piece of raw land to do a ten, another 1031 exchange because you found something actually let me change the dates a little bit we sell investment property number one on day zero we identify a piece of raw land on day 45 because that was the only thing we could find we acquire that property on day 120 and then on day 150 we find something else that we really really like so we put that raw land up on the market to resell again. Because this person, looking at it objectively, that person bought the raw land simply to buy themselves time to buy that, that third piece of property. If, however, they're buying that piece of raw land and they're going to hold on to it for an extended period of time, while they maybe consider 
uh, developing it or subdividing it, those kinds of things, that might be different. Uh, it really is a fact intensive situation, but the, the short answer is no limited number of times you can do a 1031 exchange in a year or with a stream of properties or in a lifetime, at least as the tax code is written today. Thank you, David. Um, and then this one also kind of pairs well with that. Um, the question is, what was it called when heirs inherit the property at fair value and not pay the capital gains? Obviously, this is a estate planning topic that could be talked about for, for even a couple more hours. Um, but David, do you mind giving just a small scope of what that looks like? Sure. So grandpa had his investment property and when he dies, or actually if he sold the property outright after having done a stream of 1031 exchanges, all of the capital gain tax and depreciation tax he had sought to avoid all those years now comes home to roost. So he really wants to not ever sell that property if he ever does it, if he doesn't have to. When he dies and his heirs inherit the property, they get the property at the fair market value as of the date of his death, and that's called a step up in basis. So he had his basis, his adjusted basis, changing over the years as he bought and sold the various properties. When the heirs received the property on the day after his death, the value for them is the value as of the date of his death. Their basis, as if they had bought the property brand new, is the value as of the date of his death and that's called receiving a step up in basis. Perfect, thank you, David. Um, the next question, I'll go back over to Brad. And the question is, can you do a 1031 exchange if the property is bought and sold through a trust? Let's say maybe a family trust, living trust, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> a trust is going to be considered a disregarded entity like a like a single member LLC or an individual. Uh, so it follows the um, the uh, Social Security number instead of an EIN. So yes, you can. Short answer. Yeah, <laughs> great, Brad. Appreciate that. Um, maybe just as a, a quick follow up. In that case, are you able to sell a piece of property in the name of a trust and then purchase in the individual name? Ooh, you know, this comes up quite often and I am a stickler for making sure that it is still in the same name using the same uh, tax ID. Um, there have been a couple of situations where on, let's just say on the flip side of that, there is a um, single member LLC that is selling the property, but they want to purchase the property uh, using their name. Uh, that has happened before and it, it it's okay. Um, my personal preference when we're going through this is uh, pretty strict on it, you know, making sure that it is the same name and the same taxpayer ID. Um, but with a disregarded entity, yes. If Owen, not, I, yeah, I, I want to just piggyback on that. Go ahead. Um, because, Owen, I think the facts as you ask them um, are less likely to happen than the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody owns their current property in a trust, it's there for asset protection purposes. So they would probably not be likely to then purchase the replacement property in their individual names. However, it could go the other way where the current property is in their individual name and they've now established a trust and they want to buy that replacement property inside the trust. And as long as it is a revocable trust or a living trust, that can happen. Thanks, David, um, and thank you, Brad. Well, David, since I got you on the screen here, does the relinquished property have to be owned for a specific period of time, a holding period, uh, before you can sell it and do a 1031 exchange? There is no statutorily prescribed holding period for any of the properties. Um, that said, the shorter the holding period, the more likely you are to receive scrutiny from the IRS. For example, if I buy my first invest, well, let me give you this answer. If somebody buys a piece of property to fix it up and flip it and resell it, 
that doesn't qualify for 1031 exchange purposes. If I know, for example, that a property is going to become available because the tent, the occupant died and the grandchildren just want to sell it and I can buy it real cheap because they just want it gone. And all I really need to do is vacuum the carpets and wash the sinks and that kind of stuff and then resell it. I mean, that's not even a fix and flip. That's just resell. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, the, the the bottom line is that there must have been an intent to use that property as an investment property. Terrific. Thank you, David. And, I, and I'm I am going to go back to talking about to the trust and disregarded entities. I think there uh, might be some clarity still needed on what maybe what is a disregarded entity and and how it works to really either sell in a disregarded entity, and purchase in an individual name, or um, do your entire exchange through maybe different different disregarded entities? Sure. This is this is a good question. Um, you know, when you when you own the property in your own name, if a tenant suffers a catastrophic injury, and they get a huge judgment against you, they effectively have the right to collect from all of your assets, and that's where a limited liability company comes in, an LLC. And the name very clearly describes what it does. It limits the liability to only those assets within that LLC. So if I buy my first investment property in David Real Estate One LLC, and if I am the sole member, the sole shareholder of that LLC, it is disregarded for income tax purposes meaning it does not have to file its own income tax return. It's simply an additional attachment to my personal income tax return. That LLC will probably have its own EIN number for banking purposes because banks will not open an account unless there's an EIN attached to the LLC. But now when I own that property inside of that LLC, if again, my tenant suffers some catastrophic injury or one of their guests does, the worst thing that will happen is that they'll get a judgment that exceeds the value of my insurance and they can levy against the property itself and they can take the property. The worst thing that, they, that can happen to me is that they take that property. And when I say that's the worst thing that can happen, that still does require that I need to go through certain formalities each year with regard to the operation of that LLC, and the taxpayer should consult with their attorney and their CPA about that. So now I've sold the first property from David Real Estate One LLC. When I go to buy my next property, I can buy that in David Real Estate Two LLC. And that would be particularly important because most of our taxpayers don't buy in properties with their names on them, but rather with the street address on them. So if I sell my first property from DG 123 Main Street LLC and I'm buying my next property at uh, Dolphin Cove, I don't want it to be owned by 123 Main Street LLC. I want it to be owned by DG Dolphin Cove LLC. Thank you, David. Um, and then this one, this one, David, I'll, I'll also leave over to you. Brett, I'll, I'll pass the next one over to you, I promise here. Um, but this question is in regards to, can you do a 1031 exchange in reverse order? Meaning, can you buy a property and then sell an investment property you may already own? That's another wonderful question. Yes, you can. This is actually a topic that's covered in one of our other webinars. Uh, but the short answer is yes, you can. Uh, the short description of the process is that you need to get us involved a little bit earlier. As Brad said that uh, a few minutes ago, he, he got one done in about 45 minutes. Uh, that's, that's not unusual in our office. That happens with some regularity. But with a reverse exchange, as this is known, uh, I would request that you give us a call a little bit sooner than that because we have to go out and form an LLC usually in the state where the property is located, sometimes elsewhere for a variety of reasons. Um, 
that LLC will buy the property on your behalf. The LLC doesn't have any money, so you need to lend the money to the LLC to buy that property. We buy that property through the LLC on your name, on your behalf, and now you have 45 days to identify which of the properties you already own that you will be selling, and you have up to a total of 180 days to complete the sale of that property, at which point we either give you the deed for the new property or the LLC, depending on a variety of factors, uh, but a reverse exchange conversation takes up about an hour in one of my CLE seminars, so you'll forgive me if I confine it to two and a half minutes here. <laughs> well, thank you, David. And then Brad, just as promised, I'm gonna go ahead and switch the question over to you. Um, this is a question that we've been getting pretty regularly, uh, especially with, with a new newer real estate investors. But what would you say is almost in your experience, the minimum amount of value in a property that you would recommend doing a 1031 exchange on? Oh, that's <clears throat> that's interesting. Um, that's actually the first time I've heard that question, um, David. Um, Any time that you have uh, equity in something, and your the amount of taxes that you would have to pay is going to be higher than it would be for an exchange, I say do an exchange, right? Uh, so you can keep deferring those. So as long as you're doing like, let's say a forward exchange and your tax bill is going to be $15,000, but it's going to cost you $1,200 to defer 15,000. I would say that that would be a good idea to do a forward exchange. Um, but if it's if it's less than that, um, I've, and I've actually had this conversation with a taxpayer before um, that they need to get with their accountant or their CPA um, because I'm not seeing a reason for them to do an exchange. <laughs> Rather, they could take the funds and do something else with it if they want to. They're not going to be locked in to have to do it, do an exchange for another property um, because I'm not finding that the value is really there to do it. Yeah, absolutely, Brad. If, if, the, if the value of the tax deferral outweighs the thousand or two thousand dollars in exchange fees it's worth it i've seen taxpayers do an exchange where even after paying fees they saved only four or five thousand dollars in taxes that's four or five thousand dollars i'd rather have in my pocket than giving it to uncle joe <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh thank you brad and then one more over to you um and th this is one where uh just within the recent news and everything going on with financial institutions, can you talk about the security of funds that get deposited with Real 1031? Yeah, and I, I might want David to chime in on this one because he's he's been pretty uh, proactive uh, on this discussion within uh, the company, but um, we have been uh, very aware and hyper vigilant of everything that's going on. Um, the institutions that we do um, you know, have these, uh, you know, segregated escrow accounts with um, are very well known, very trusted, um, and we have been in business with them for a long time. Um, it has come up that, you know, the FDIC uh, coverage is up to 250. Well, uh, majority of our exchanges seem to be above that 250 mark, um, but we are happy to accommodate with uh, separate accounts to make sure that that those amounts do not exceed that uh, 250, $250,000 FDIC coverage. Um, David, is there something on this that you would like to expand on? Yeah, you 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 hit 90% of what I would have said. Um, yes, we can spread the accounts out over multiple banks. Uh, that's not a problem. In fact, some of our banks will actively assist in doing that with us. But the first line of defense is ensuring that the bank itself is a stable bank. Our CFO is constantly monitoring the strength and the stability and the ratings of the banks. There are various rating systems out there that you can use to determine how strong and how safe a bank is. Uh, we use what is called the Bauer system, B-A-U-E-R. It's publicly available information. You can 
go to their website, type in the name of any bank, and they will tell you it's a it's a star based rating system, zero to I think it's one to five stars. <clears throat> um, you can type in whatever bank you want, Citibank or uh, you know First Ocean Trust or whatever it might be, and they will tell you what the rating is. And for free, you can get like two or three sentences of commentary as to why they got that rating and, and a little bit of additional information. If you want to dive deep, you have to pay um, to be a member of the Bauer service. But the free information is, is usually quite helpful. And we ensure, again, we review our banking relationships constantly, daily, weekly, monthly, and our money, your money, is only at banks with four stars or above. Terrific. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Brad. Um, I do show that that's the end of our hour webinar here today. If anyone has any questions that they did not have their answers, um, or at least their questions asked during this Q&A portion, please feel free to reach out to Brad or David. The contact information should be on your screen again once more. Uh, but thank you both, both very much. Thank you very much, Melanie, for having us on Real Source U. And okay. everyone, have a have a great day. And uh, for everyone that's still with us, I dropped a link into the uh, Q and A for a quick survey. Just let us know how you liked the programming today, um, and and we would love for you to go ahead and and give us some feedback. So. Have a wonderful weekend, uh, Brad, David, Owen. Thank you so much for joining us again today. I absolutely love when you guys come to talk about 1031 Exchange. And again, to my audience, especially over here on the on the East Coast, I know it's late in the afternoon, so I'm going to wish you a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, hopefully it's either a very relaxing weekend or a very productive weekend, whichever you would prefer. And I'll see everybody next time.